So we're going to call it the same. Now, if you want to go to Children's Church today and you're of that age, you may go down to Children's Church. All right. So nice to see you guys wanting to go down and learn about God. We're going to be talking for the next few weeks about a serious subject. Actually, several serious subjects. Ones that we probably already know, but plagues our society today. Leaves them in question. And with the right thinking. Because the Old Testament and New Testament don't always blend. How God is in the Old Testament isn't always how He is in the New Testament sometimes. So it makes people wonder, what do I believe? What should I believe? So we'll start out with right, unsure, and wrong. What makes us different than everyone else? What makes us different than the religions in the world? Now when I say religions, I'm talking man-made beliefs. Don't get it confused that we're a religion, because we're not. We are a faith. There's a difference. What makes us different? What makes us different than the person outside who does not have the faith that we have? What makes us different than all the other beliefs in the world? That is, we believe fully on the Word of God. What we do is based on the Word of God. What we think is based on the Word of God. How we live is based on the words of God. It's called the Bible. And that's what makes us different than everyone else. That's what separates us. That's why we're called a New Testament church. Because we apply not just the old, but the new to our lives. And with that saying it, we begin to think sometimes that there's black and white, but to the world, there's a lot of gray. And we need to understand, how can we talk to the world and explain to them that what you feel is gray is either black or it's white when it comes to God. It's either right or it's wrong. There is no, well, you know, God kind of just let you figure it out yourself, and he's going to be care less about it. My parents taught us a very important thing growing up, and that is they will not lie for us. They will not do anything that contradicts God on our behalf. And lying was a problem. Now, how many of you ever had to go out and cut the switch off the tree for yourselves? Yeah, there's some of you chuckling. You understand, you had to do that. My parents had a rule. Back then, we didn't have cell phones. We had a phone on a wall. And it was right by the, ba or the bathroom and the kitchen door. We had two exits, the front door and the back door. As teenagers, we started becoming kind of popular with people, and people wanted to call us, we wanted to call them. And the rule was this. If the phone rang and you're in the house and someone wants to talk to you, guess what? Mom and Dad answers it, you're going to talk. Because you're in the house. They're not going to lie to you. So the thing was this. Phone rings. Me and my brothers would look at each other. Bam, we're out one of the doors. The closest door we could find. But we stood outside the door and we could listen. Mom would pick it up. Who do you want to talk to? Bobby? Uh, no, he's not in the house. Ronnie? No, he's not in the house. Well, you want to talk to him? No, he's not in the house. That was the rule. Because if we were in the house, we were going to be forced to talk to someone we didn't want to talk to. Usually it was someone that was kind of annoying, you know, like kind of people. So it was like, hit the doors. Then when the all clears come in, you come back in, resume life again. That's the rules that my parents had. They weren't going to lie for us. So if we're outside the house, they could say, nope, they're not in the house. And it's a lovely rule. Loved it. Lived by it. Today we're going to be talking about, is lying okay? Is there times in our lives that we can lie, and God says, you know, that was for a good reason. So every week, I'm going to ask you three questions. And I would love it if you will raise your hands. Teenagers will, and I'm sure they have a lot more to lose than you do. So there will be no judgments. There will be no pointing out fingers. It's solely on what you personally believe at this point in time. The first question is, when it comes to lying, how many of you feel God does not consider it a sin when we lie for a just and righteous cause. Go ahead and raise your hand if you believe God will not consider that a sin. Okay. How many of you feel God does not or does consider it a sin no matter what the reason when you lie? It is a sin. Go ahead and raise your hand if you feel that way. Okay, here's the third question. How many of you either don't know or have really never given it much thought to how God feels when you lie for a good reason? Feel that way. Now, some of you just 
just aren't paying attention or something. I don't know. Because I've given you three options and something like, I ain't going to do it. So that's okay. We'll warm up to this. We'll get used to this. I'm an interactive person. Throughout the Old Testament, we see contradiction with God. Or so it seems. It seems like God allows sins to happen, and he's okay with it. But now I have a theory for that. And it's biblically based and sound. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. Today, we're going to be in the book of 2 Kings. Today, we're going to be talking in 2 Kings chapter 10, 18 through 27. Now, hold that in readiness while I give you the background. Because it's vital you understand what's happening that leads to this point. Israel and Judah have been one nation until Solomon dies. When he dies, his son divides the kingdom. For 55 years at this point, the kingdoms have been divided between Israel and Judah. And for 31 years, Ahaz and Jezebel introduced something that God found completely detestable, like abomination. And cannot believe that his people would allow this. Because it was happening elsewhere. It was, it was what was going on. It was a major religion at the time. And it was the practice of Baal. Or as some of you might have heard, Baal. If you want to look professional and you want to sound scholarly, say Baal. That's how they pronounce it back then. Baal is a worship of blood. Now if you've been in my Wednesday night studies, you understand what Baal is about. Baal says if you have a firstborn son and you want to build a house, you bury your firstborn son alive in a jar and you put him underneath your threshold. That way his spirit protects your house. You're a king and you want to build a kingdom? You take your firstborn son and you bury him at the front gates. Then you take all your officials' firstborn sons and you bury them at all the main intersections and the main pedestals holding up the walls. Then you take your citizens' firstborn sons and you bury them all along the walls in jars while they're alive. Their souls will then protect your city. To honor and worship your God, you have to offer a human sacrifice. Which means you take an infant by the heels and by the wrist, and you rake him across the grill till they go through. That is one way you worship Baal. Now do you understand why God finds this an abomination? What parent in the right mind would want to do this? But this was a common religion back then. A common practice amongst all the other nations, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, all of them practice ball. And then when Ahab, the king of Israel, gets in control, he marries Jezebel and she brings it with her. And it becomes a dominant religion amongst the Israelites. So much that if you're an Israelite who believes in God, you kind of hide. You kind of withdraw from society because you don't want to be a part of that. But if you're not a part of it, you're made fun of and ridiculed amongst your own peers. God has had enough. God has said, all right, enough's enough. My slow to anger has ended its time. I'm going to blow up. So what God does is, we have a king who is fighting Syria, and he gets the king of Judah to join him. And the king of Israel and the king of Judah go into this little city right in the middle of Israel where he feels protected. And he leads his generals to fight the battle for him. The man of God, it says, gets a message from God and tells his messenger, go anoint a new king. The messenger runs in and finds the generals in their meeting and he says, I need to talk to you. The general's like, you need to talk to you. I need to talk to Jehu. All right, Jehu. Jehu takes him in a private meeting. The servant goes, you're the king. Throws oil on him and runs out the door. Jehu comes out and says, hey guys, guess what? God just says, I'm the new king. And everyone is excited because everyone knows the heart of Jehu. Jehu is not about Baal. He is not about them. He's totally against it, but because he serves a king, he has to abide by it. But now that he's a new king, times are going to change. Things are going to wrap up and end, and a great warrior is going to come back to Israel. And the kings, the king knows this, and the generals know this, and they're all excited. That's where we're going to begin, because Jehu goes and kills the ex-king. He even has Judas kings assassinated. He kills off the priests that are with the king. He even wipes out the king's family so that Baal is gone on that side of the fence. There will be no one bringing Baal 
yelled back from that side. Then we begin in 2 Kings 10, 18 through 27. Because Baal is still in the community. Verse 18. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Jehu is lying. He has no intent to keep Baal practice going on. He has no intent of fully, truly worshiping Baal. None at all. But he lied to the congregation of Israel. God doesn't do anything at this point. Now therefore, he says, call to me all the prophets of Baal, all of his worshipers, and all of his remaining priests. Let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. Well, he is lying, but he's not lying at the same time with that. And we'll figure out what that means in just a moment. Whoever is missing shall not live. He's telling the truth there. If you don't show up, we will see. We will kill you. But Jehu did it with a cunning in order to destroy the worshippers of Baal. You see, his reasoning is based on what God feels. He knows God is detestable when it comes to this man-made religion. So he understands the heart of God. He says, so fine. If God finds this detestable, then I am fully in my rights to say whatever I need to say and do whatever I need to do to get rid of it. Right? Or is that wrong? Or are you unsure? Let that think in for a minute. Is he right? Is he wrong? I don't know. Jehu ordered in verse 20, Sanctify a solemn assembly from all. So they proclaimed it. So he took a day out of the year and said, this is the day we're going to worship all. This is going to be a holiday for him. You've had other holidays, but this is going to be a major holiday. Where it's been in different cities at different times, I'm going to put it all under one roof. Think of a football stadium-sized roof is what he's going to put it under. And Jehu sent throughout all of Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. And they entered the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was filled from end to end. There wasn't anywhere place for anyone to sit down. It was shoulder to shoulder, back to front, all the way. Clam, cram full of people. Everyone who believed in Baal was there. They didn't want to disappoint the new king. He said to him who was in charge of the war group, bring out the vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. So he brought out the vestments for them. Now what that means is everyone's going to wear a symbol saying they're a follower of all. Real easy to point out someone. Like if you go to a football game and you're for the Colts and you wear your Colts jersey amongst a bunch of Patriots, you stand out like a sore thumb. I guarantee you, I've been there, done that, don't do it again. Then Jehu went into the house of all with Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. He kind of made an agreement with this guy early on. I forgot to mention that, but that's okay. You can go ahead and read the full story. And he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search and see that there is no servant of the Lord here among you, but only the worshippers of Baal. He wants them to look around and make sure that there's no spy, no believer in God who snuck in to see if he could do something to interrupt this. He wants only those who have turned from God and are worshipping a false God and doing practices that God finds detestable. That's the only ones he wants to encompass. That's the only ones he wants there. Because, it says, Then he went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had stationed 80 men outside and said, The man who allows any of those who are given in your hands to escape shall forfeit his life. He's going to annihilate them all. So as soon as he made an end of the offering and burnt offering, Jehu said to the guard and to the officers, Go in, strike them down, let not a man escape. So then when they put their, them to the sword, the guard and the officers cast them out. So they cut everyone down, drag their bodies out, lay them around the complex. And they went into the inner room of the house of Baal, and they brought out the pillar that was in the house of Baal and burned it. And they demolished the pillar of Baal and demolished the house of Baal and made it a latrine to this day. Now that's not saying to this day as you read it, but that's saying to the day when this author wrote this book, that that was the public latrine. If you had a chamber pot, you would walk over and dump it on that site. 
You wouldn't want to put foot on that site. You wouldn't want to dig in that site. They made it such a place that no one would want to be around. It had a stench to it. It was disgusting and everyone would avoid it. That's what Jehu did. He said, look, do you understand what God feels about Baal? Let me show you. This is what God feels about Baal. People who don't fully understand God will look at that scripture and say, well, see, God okay, lying. It was for a good purpose. And it's not the only time in the Old Testament we're going to see that. We're going to see a lot of times people lie for a good purpose. And God doesn't strike them down. Why? Why doesn't he? Well, here comes my theory. It starts with the great exodus out of Egypt. As we were discussing in Sunday school today, God pulled a people out of Egypt to be the light to the rest of the world. A light that was going to shine on God and tell these other pagans, look, here's God. Come this way. Come know God. But they don't do that. All they do is grumble, complain, and fight against God. All the way through the Exodus. So God finally says to Moses, like three or four times actually, these are no longer my people. Let me wipe them completely out. Let me obliterate them. And uh, Moses... Because I promised you that I would allow you to lead my people in and make my people the light of this world. I promised you that and I promised Abraham that and I promised those that follow him after that. I will pick new people from them to be that. But let me wipe out all these. And Moses says, no. No, 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 no. And he stops God many times. Finally, God says, that's fine. I no longer will honor these people. They now become your people. They're your problem. Let you deal with them. I will help you, and I will defend you, and I will defend those who are righteous and living according to what you say, but for the rest of them, forget it. That's why I believe that God didn't squash every time someone lied, like he did with Ananias and Sapphira. The first time they lied, bam, they got dead. There was no second chances. But in the Old Testament, we see a lot of this. God, now you say in the New Testament this is wrong. God, you said this is wrong. Why are you allowing this? Because God said, look, I've kind of given up on these people. So I'm going to let them kind of do their thing, but I still have a remnant, and I'm going to use that remnant to bring about my son, the new salvation, the true light into the world. That's why he allowed these things over here. And I'm telling you this so you can go out to the people out there and explain the same thing to them who have question over this. Because I guarantee you, and I've met them, there are adults and youth alike who question why God allowed it there and now tells us we can't do it here. What's the difference? And the difference is God said, I brought my son. He wrote it all clean. He changed it up. He told them, hey, look, you want to follow God? You want to be a part of God? You got to do what I do. That's the reason. There's a story I've told, and I'm sure many of you have heard, when I was a youth minister at a church camp in Camp Allendale, Indiana. It was a very hot summer day. We had a slip and slide. And there was a pump house like that across the way of the slip and slide. And there was a teenage girl, and she didn't want to get in the water because the fish peed in the water. And she didn't want to get in that. So I, after some youth coaches brought her up to me and said, Ron, she's having no fun. All of her peers are down there swimming. All of her peers are enjoying this. Ron, can you do something? Ron, in his quick thinking, <coughs> lies to the girl and tells her, look, see that house? That's where the fish go pee. But you'll never see it because like you and I, we don't like people looking at us when we're peeing. So they pee when no one else is around. So it's okay to swim in that water. Now was I wrong in doing so? Was I wrong in trying to help her out to get cooled off, and enjoy what camp had to offer? Or should I let her just suffer in the high heat and be made fun of by her friends? Which one was right? Well, if you say, Ron, you, you really were wrong in sinning. You sinned in this because you lied to her. You're absolutely right. That is right. And there's a damage that I did not consider for years about this. And here's the damage. She's a teenage girl. She goes back to her cabin and tells all the girls in her cabin, oh, Mr. Ron, who's the dean, and is the Christian leader in this group, 
says the fish don't pee in the water. Now, the rest of the girls, if they're smart enough, are going to realize, no, that's a complete and bold-faced lie. Fish pee in the water. Then what's going to happen to her? She's going to be ridiculed. She was probably laughed at. Then she goes home to her home church and tells her home church this. And she gets made fun of. She might have even went to her parents and said, guess what I found out? Fish don't pee in the water after all. And her parents probably made fun of her. She goes to school with that theory and gets made fun of. Or maybe just because she spoke at one place, it spread like wildfire. Do you believe, can you believe this girl believes that fish don't pee in the river or in the water of any kind? Her goldfish must get out and go to the bathroom and she's asleep at night. That's what she thinks. So can you imagine the damage I did to that girl? Every time I might have told a kid like that, that kind of thing. Thinking, hey, I have great intentions. I have, I have very righteous intentions. Yet, I lied to her and didn't conceive the consequences down the road. God says there's a difference with my people now from those who chose to follow the path of old. And that is in First Corinthians, or Colossians, I'm sorry, Colossians 1, 1 through 10. Colossians 3 says this, 1, 1 through 10, I'm sorry, Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So when we accepted Christ as our Savior, we no longer seek what the world does. We no longer try to be like the world. We try to be different. And one thing that he says in verse 9 is this. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Do not lie to one another. Does that mean I go out lying to the rest of the world who doesn't believe what I believe? It kind of looks like that, right? But that's not what God says. How can I be a light to anyone if I'm going to lie to them? If I'm, I can't lie to anyone <coughs> you, and I definitely should not lie to anyone out there either. That's what God says. That's what Jesus says. You want to follow me? Cut that part out. Get rid of that part. That is not acceptable for any reason it appears. You should not be lying to anyone. And the boiling the scripture down says this. We are not merely act like Christians, but totally to commit to being a Christian. Being a child of God. So the choice is this. The right choice to the question I asked earlier is to lie is a sin. There's no gray area to that. There's no what if. What if, on what if I had a really righteous reason? Would God really consider it a sin? The answer would be yes. Yes, he would. Proverbs 14, 5 tells us this. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. <laughs> a faithful witness. One who truly believes in God and is following God will not lie for any reason. For no reason at all. There's no good reason. Now, I posed some questions to my oldest son and placed some scenarios, and he was quick-witted enough to fight back with me on this. And... Or why'd you do that? Why'd you say that? Why, what? I'm like, all right, all right, enough with you. But here's the story I first posed in. You're in a workplace. You work on the seventh level of a building. You have a work person in your work who you cannot stand. No one can stand them. No one's nice to them. And one day you're just typing away and working. Who knows? Someone's slipping by on the outside of your ledge window. You open up your window, see who it is, and it's that employee. You say, hey, what are you doing? Um, I'm going to jump. No one likes me. You don't want that on your conscience, do you? You're the one that can bring him back off the ledge? You don't want to say, hey, go ahead and jump, because you're right, no one loves you. Just go ahead and end it all. That's cool. Man, I'm going to go back to work now. You wouldn't do that, I hope. So what do you do? Do you say, hey, that's not true? You know, because I, I kind of like it. See you jump, man. No, no, come on in. Man, we can be friends. Just step on back in with me here. I need to carry it up for like 30 minutes with you. Convincing them that you want to be their friend. When you know in your heart, that is the farthest thing from the truth. But you're doing it for
for a right reason. You're trying to save a soul, a human being, from jumping to their death. So they come in. They go to the hospital. They get treatment for whatever caused them to go that direction. They come back and you're typing in your office and they said, hey, they come and lean the door. So what's going on? Nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. You want to hang out today? No, I can't. Hey, uh, uh, you want to go out to pizza later on? No, I'm busy. Hey, uh, you know, uh, what about this weekend? I got a game to the football game. Do you want to go? No, man, not interested. And you just keep giving them the cold shoulder. Finally, they look at you and say, hey, what's up? I thought we were friends. I thought you wanted to be my friend. Well, we got to hang together. No, nah, man, I like you the whole way. I just sit and see jump off and put that on my conscience. Have a nice day. There's not a reason, one, that we have to lie. There was other things you probably told that person to keep them from jumping. That God loves them. That God doesn't want to see that. That God sent a Savior down to save them. That there's, there's most likely someone in this world who loves them. And if they jump, they'll never meet that person. You can tell them all kinds of truths like that. And that would be okay. That would be perfectly acceptable. There's a reason why we don't lie, though. And it's, it's with this as well. What you say in jest will be taken in truth as well. My dad knew a guy that could tell a story and you'd never know unless he told you it was a story. You would think it was a gospel truth. Every time he talked, you had to listen and you had to weigh it out and say, could that possibly be real? Every time he talked, you never knew what he was telling you was truth or fake. And he was just messing with you. And the problem is, when someone like that tries to tell you about Jesus, are you telling me the truth? Or are you messing with me? Are you really telling me the truth that there's a guy who raised from the dead after three days of being dead? Are you really telling me the truth that there's a God who's created everything and loves me no matter what I've done? Or are you messing with me? Which is it? You see, that's the problem. When we lie, those that we're talking with and those who might know us hear it and say, well, I don't believe it. I don't believe that uh, what you're worshiping and what you're teaching and what you're preaching is the same thing. No, I don't believe it no more. I believe it's all a lie because that seems what you do is lie. 1 Peter 3.10 tells us, though, there's an upside to not lying. 1 Peter 3.10 says this, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. God promises. God guarantees us a good life. I can't tell you what a good life is. I can tell you what a good life for me is, but what's a good life for you? That's something different. And it's going to be different for everyone. But God promises you, if you do not lie, no matter what situation you go through, you're going to have a good life. It might not be the good that you want, but according to God, it's a good life. And that's all that matters, right? We follow God. We follow Christ. It's going to be a great life. So the benefits are going to outweigh the consequences. Yes, you might lose a friend or two who say, hey, does this outfit make me look fat? Well, honestly, yes, me. I'm going to tell you the truth. Yes, it does. Or no, it doesn't. Does this shirt compliment me? Absolutely no, man. Throw that away. How's my cooking? The worst ever. <coughs> I have a little brother that you better never ask questions like that ever because he is going to be straightforward and honest with you 100%, which can sometimes be brutal and it's drove people away. But other people are like, man, at least he's honest with me. I thought everyone loved that dish of the uh, cooking. No, no one liked it. They ate it just because they went upset him. Our reward for not lying is not just a good time here, a good day here for us. It's going to be a wonderful eternity in heaven. God says, my people will not lie. No matter what, there will not be a reason why to lie. If you have to come up for the reason to lie, you better shut your mouth right away. Because it's wrong. And you're hearing Satan in your ears. Right now we're going to offer a time of invitation as the praise team comes up. I just want to open up and let you know that we have a baptism. 